Whatever this kingdom was about, self-enlightenment or free love, Sheila says it was about money, heaps of it. Sheila says Bhagwan milked some $200 million from 30,000 Rajneeshis around the world. Bhagwan had the product which was not tangible, so it was a perfect product to market called enlightenment. Bhagwan, it's time that you let people know who you are, the way I have come to know you, which is that on one hand you're a genius and a beautiful man, and on the other hand, you really exploit people by using their human frailty and emotions. She is drugged. She is on hard drugs. It is true. I exploit people. I exploit them because that is the only way to wake them up. Exploitation is not necessarily evil. And I am a genius in exploitation. Love affair never ends. It can turn into a hate affair. She did not prove to be a woman. She proved to be a perfect bitch. <laughs> I love bitches. <laughs> Many of them. Welcome back, my name is Louise. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe and if you're returning, welcome back. Today I wanted to talk about whether Eastern philosophy, in particular Buddhism and Hinduism, whether what they believe is compatible with Christianity. Because unfortunately there are some Christians out there who are like, oh yes, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in Buddha, and I also believe in these other teachers. And surprisingly, I had someone saying that they think that Osho, who you saw just before, is a great teacher, and that he is comparable to Jesus. And either that person does not know Jesus at all, or that person does not know Osho at all, or both, possibly both. Because as you can see, he does not love his enemies. He does not turn the other cheek. He does not lay down his life for anyone else. He is extremely selfish. He had a fleet of more than 90 different Rolls Royces in the middle of nowhere on their Oregon ranch. And he was constantly like dripping in diamond encrusted Rolex watches, which begs the question, where was he going? And why did he need to be so punctual? So yeah, let's compare a greedy self-serving teacher with the ultimate act of brotherly love. Does Eastern philosophy teach the same level of compassion that Christianity does. Because these days they claim that they do, especially if you read the writings of the current Dalai Lama. There's a quote here from the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, which says, the essence of Mahayana Buddhism is compassion. But what does he mean by compassion? How does Buddhism define that term? Well, he also writes that the Tibetan word for compassion, niying ye, or niying je, I'm not quite sure, connotes love, affection, kindness, gentleness, generosity of spirit, and warm-heartedness. 
So that all sounds pretty good, right? Seems like it's compatible with Christianity. The Latin etymology of the word compassion is derived from compassio, which is where we also get the word companion from, and means to be in company or fellowship with someone else. And pati, which means suffering. In other words, compassion means to suffer with someone. It very much embodies the concept of empathy, but no one in history has personally embodied the idea of compassion the way that Jesus of Nazareth did. And we see this in the passage from Isaiah, where it says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Not many people would be willing to die for crimes that they did not commit, and even fewer people would be willing to die for crimes that other people committed especially if those people rejected you, spat on you, flogged you, beat you, talked trash about you. Would you still lay down your life for those people? If those people were in a court of law and they were condemned by their own deeds, would you take their place in jail or would you take their place in execution? That is the benchmark that Jesus set for compassion and for love. As it says in Romans chapter 5, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The biblical word for love, the Greek word for love is agape and there's multiple different words for love within the ancient greek language agape is just one of them it has nothing to do with sexual love which is called eros and it has nothing to do with friendship which is called philia agape love is the love that god has for humanity and it has absolutely nothing to do with how he feels about us he doesn't have to feel good about how we behave towards him. He has made a commitment. That's what agape love is about. It's a commitment to do things that are for the benefit of another person, not for the benefit of you. So when the Dalai Lama says that compassion is all about affection and warm heartedness, that has nothing to do with agape love. Because agape love is not about how someone else makes you feel. They might make you feel like trash. You still need to be able to find it within yourself to act in a certain way towards them. Biblical love towards other people is a type of behavior which you do in spite of how they behave towards you. Despite how they make you feel, you do not behave badly towards them. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your father in heaven is perfect. So in other words, you don't have to feel good about how someone else behaves towards you in order to behave differently towards them. Your response to hostility is compassion. And as Peter wrote, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil 
or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And here's the thing. There is a presupposition in Christianity that there is such a thing as human evil and that it is a real problem, not on the scale that we can necessarily atone for by our works and by our deeds. And this problem of human evil comes from the state of our hearts, that our hearts are very far from God, that we have turned away from what he wants us to do and we have gone after the things that we want. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. At no point did Jesus ever preach neutrality. He preached that there is no such thing as a fence to sit on. You are either with him or you are against him. You either have a heart that bears good fruit or you have a heart that bears evil fruit. Jesus preached that there is a clear delineation between right and wrong, good and evil, God and Satan. There is no such thing as a detachment to the outcome or a detachment from other people. When he speaks about fruit, he's speaking about someone interacting with other people and what the outcome is of that interaction, whether the outcome is good or the outcome is bad. And it has nothing to do with any kind of lofty intentions or feelings that they might have towards the person but it's the actual behavior and the actual outcome of what they did. Not only did Jesus preach that deeds speak louder than words or feelings, but every time Jesus felt compassion for someone, it wasn't just a feeling. It actually prompted him into action, as we can see in Matthew 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. In that particular passage, if you read it in context, Jesus had just received the news that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded and he was seeking solitude so that he could grieve. However, he was followed to the place where he had gone to grieve by the multitude of people. And instead of being annoyed at them or angry with them for invading his privacy while he was in mourning, he had compassion on them and he turned around and he put his own feelings aside and he spent time healing their sick. And when he had finished healing their sick, he then fed them. This is just one example of Jesus making other people's needs his priority instead of seeking his own enlightenment or glory. The parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 is an example that Jesus gives for what agape love actually means. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells the story about a man who is on a remote and dangerous back road. He gets jumped by a bunch of thieves. They take all of his stuff, beat him half to death and leave him on the side of the road to die. And two people come along, two religious leaders pass by, a priest and a Levite. And these are like the most important religious leaders of the Jewish people. So they are the people who should be the ones extending charity to others. They should be the ones showing compassion, right? But they pass by. They commit what is called 
the bystander effect, which is where we see someone in trouble and we do nothing because we figure, well, that's someone else's problem. Someone else will help them out. Someone else will do this. Someone else will do that. Well, guess what? You are someone else. We are all someone. We can all be someone in times of crisis and when it comes to noticing that people are not okay. So who is the person in Jesus' story who actually shows and demonstrates neighborly love? Well, the person who is the hero of his story is one of the people who is shunned and rejected in Jewish society, which is a Samaritan. Jesus doesn't care how religious you are. Jesus doesn't care how much you know about theology or how enlightened you are if you never show love to anyone, if you never physically demonstrate it. What use are you? This goes back to that passage in James where you can wish well for people as much as you like and it has no purpose. There is no point to your well wishes. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The way that a lot of people think about compassion and write about compassion and talk about compassion, it's very similar to how C.S. Lewis explained it. It is easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. To paraphrase Jane Austen, it is a truth universally acknowledged that people are difficult to love. The Christian mandate is not to find people easy to love because they're not. The Christian mandate is to love them anyway. It's the story about how God loves us that even in our most unlovable moments, he is still reaching out and trying to redeem us. And that is the story of the gospel. That is the message of the cross. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. All of this stuff is a great concept, until you have to actually apply it to the people who have abused you, to the guy who cut you off in traffic or cussed you out in a shop, to the girl who cheated on you, or your neglectful parents, or your housemate that stole from you, or the co-worker who took credit for all of your ideas. What does it mean to actually love those people? It's an interesting question. The Bible doesn't say that you need to hang out with evil people. In fact, it actually says the opposite. But even though you might not spend time with them and you might make sure that you keep your distance, it doesn't mean that you don't care, that you don't pray for them, or that you wouldn't be able to help them out if they were in desperate need. Whereas someone like Osho, if Sheila, was on fire, I don't think he would piss on her. In Christianity, we do need to forgive people and we do need to let go of resentment because chances are God will, God will forgive them. And then you're going to have to spend eternity with that person. 
all those people who have mistreated you throughout life, God is offering them the same redemption that he is offering to you. And he would offer the same redemption to both Osho and Sheila, which kind of flies in the face of karma. So let's talk about karma. There are three main causes of suffering alluded to in the Bible. Number one, inexplicable human suffering, which comes from indirect external causes and the general sinful state of humanity. Number two, suffering, which is directly linked to the choices and behavior of individual people and is either inflicted on others or has natural consequences for the perpetrator. And number three, suffering for the sake of following Jesus, which is, of course, the main reason why you should be suffering if you're a Christian. But Christians can also suffer from the first lot. They definitely should not be suffering from the second one if they are inflicting something on someone else or if they are suffering the natural consequences of their own behavior. That probably means that they're not following Jesus. But the concept of karma is more vague and esoteric than a simple cause and effect which can kind of be reasonably traced back to a source point. This is the definition of karma according to Buddhists.org. Karma is a term that many people are familiar with, but relatively few people understand. They might tell you that karma is when people get what they deserve, good things happen to good people, while bad things happen to bad people. That's a very simplified version of the concept of karma, but it isn't terribly far from the truth. Karma is a concept related to Buddhism that has been described as a law of justice that determines who we are. Yogananda stated that we cannot escape our own basic patterns, but we do have the choice to follow our basic nature or work against it. Therefore, it is not the outward appearance of our actions that determine what effects they will have in the future, but the intentions behind them, apparently. Buddhists believe that we must accept the consequences of our actions and learn from them on our path to enlightenment. According to Buddhist beliefs and teachings, it is karma that determines our cycle of rebirth. Negative actions such as killing other people will lead to misfortunes, either in this life or in the next life, while virtuous actions will yield positive results. The connection between an action and the karmic result of that action are usually not obvious or even observable, but they are said to be unavoidable. Furthermore, there are five heinous actions that will result in an immediate rebirth in hell. These actions are matricide, patricide, shedding the blood of a Buddha, killing an arhat, or creating a schism in the Sangha, a monastic community of Buddhist monks and nuns. In Buddhism, most karma refers to that which leads to worldly happiness, but there is also another kind of supremely good karma that can end suffering forever. Those who are liberated by this karma achieve nirvana and do not generate any more karma. Nevertheless, Buddhists are taught to practice only wholesome actions, as they are said to eventually purify the mind and lead to liberation. Karma is not something that you can anticipate or avoid, unless you do what Buddhist teachers recommend and literally avoid people and avoid living. That's right. According to Buddhist teachings, karma is very much related to chaos theory, where a butterfly flaps its wings somewhere and then a couple of months later there's a hurricane. Karma supposes that you do some very benign thing and have a very inconsequential interaction with another person and then all of a sudden you are karmically linked to that person and you absorb some of their karma and you set in motion various different chain events which result in you accumulating baggage. So in other words, karma cannot reasonably be foreseen, nor can it be avoided. It's a very OCD kind of way of looking at the world, where it's like, if you step on a crack, if you step on an ant, you're going to get karma! Which is why there are Buddhist monks that literally just spend the entirety of their time meditating. And even worse than all of that crazy-making kind of theology, 
Karma also teaches that whatever a person is suffering, they brought upon themselves. And you should not interfere because if you interfere, then you will gain some of their karma into your karma. And then your karma will be tied to their baggage, which they cause themselves and they are suffering from it for reasons. And they are supposed to clear their own karma and you are supposed to leave them to it. So in other words, if they see someone beaten and bloody on the side of the road, they will walk straight past them. So let's have a look at what Osho actually did teach people. The Ahata is someone who makes every effort to become enlightened. And once he is enlightened, he completely forgets about those who are still groping in the dark. He has no concern with others. It is enough for him to become enlightened. In fact, according to the Ahatas, even the great idea of compassion is nothing but again another kind of attachment, and it has some significance to be understood. Compassion is also a relationship. However beautiful and great, it is also a concern with others. It is also a desire. Although it is a good desire, it makes no difference. According to the Ahatas, desire is a bondage, whether it is good or bad. The chains can be made of gold or of steel. It doesn't matter. Chains are chains. Compassion is a golden chain. The Ahata insists that nobody can help anybody else at all. The very idea of helping others is based on wrong foundations. You can only help yourself. It may occur to the ordinary mind that the Ahata is very selfish, but if you look without any prejudice, perhaps he also has something immensely important to declare to the world. Even helping the other is an interference in his life, in his lifestyle, in his destiny, in his future. Hence, Ahatas don't believe in any compassion. Compassion to them is another beautiful desire to keep you tethered to the world of attachments. It is another name, beautiful, but still just a name for a desiring mind. Why should you be interested that somebody else becomes enlightened? It is none of your business. Everybody has absolute freedom to be himself. The Ahata insists on individuality and its absolute freedom. Even for the sake of good, nobody can be allowed to interfere in anybody else's life. Also, in Buddhist teachings, there is no such thing as instant karma. That's not a real thing. That's a Western invention. And to be honest, it's more akin to what the Bible teaches in terms of reaping what you sow. The Bible does teach that what people sow, they eventually reap. However, the Bible also teaches that people suffer without having done anything to deserve it. So this is another example where the Bible contradicts the idea of karma. The book of Job is a prime example of the fact that someone can be perfectly good, perfectly righteous. They might be constantly avoiding sin and atoning for sin and bad things will still happen to them. It's not necessarily about what they have done or what they deserve. It's to do with a bigger picture that we do not have access to in terms of God's overall plan. And Jesus himself also affirms this particular worldview. So again, this proves that Jesus was no mystic Eastern teacher. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So, in other words, sometimes suffering is present so that people will seek God, so that God can be shown and demonstrated through healing. God is always looking to make contact with us, to reach us through various different means. In Christianity, certain types of suffering, such as natural disasters, are supposed to remind us that we are not God, that we do not have control over the elements, that we cannot predict things, that we cannot overpower nature. Nature overpowers us. 
and that we need a higher power to help us. Things like natural disasters are supposed to prompt us to seek God and to repent from our rebellion against him, where we keep thinking that we are gods and we can do everything for ourselves. So you see in both the book of Exodus, where it talks about the plagues of Egypt, God visited all of these plagues on the people of Egypt to try and get them to repent. And instead they harden their hearts against God. And the same thing happens again in the book of Revelation in chapter nine. God brings the trumpet judgments onto the earth and tries to get people to repent and they don't. Buddhism doesn't just teach that we don't need God and that we can do everything for ourselves, including clearing our own karma and reaching enlightenment. It also teaches that there is no God. So in that element alone, it is completely at odds with Jesus and completely at odds with Christianity. Rather than teaching people to humble themselves, Buddhism teaches people to become proud. But Christianity, in contrast, teaches people to rely on God instead of relying on themselves and to trust the wisdom of God instead of trusting their own wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. So if karma teaches people that interfering when someone else is in distress essentially gives you the virus of karma and the end result is to detach from other people, how on earth do they think they can teach compassion? Far from being altruistic, Buddhism seems to be extremely selfish. In the realm of Buddhism and karma, karmic attachments to different people keep you trapped in the cycle of samsara, the cycle of birth, death, rebirth, death, rebirth, death, reincarnation over and over and over again. So the only way to break the cycle and the only way to escape samsara is to detach from everyone else including to the point of never offering compassion to anyone. The God of the Bible does not agree with this sentiment. In fact, he actually cares very much about what people are doing. He is constantly trying to reach out to people and constantly trying to reason with them. And they are very unreasonable because they believe that they are holier than thou. The Lord says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. A people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. So this is essentially what God thinks about people who are so enlightened that they don't need him anymore. They have detached themselves from other people. They have detached themselves from God and they do not have any conscience about it. As one of Osho's teachers, Bodhidharma said, I only talk about seeing your nature I don't talk about sex simply because you don't see your nature. Once you see your nature, sex is basically immaterial. It ends along with your delight in it. Even if some habits remain, they can't harm you because your nature is essentially pure. Despite dwelling in a material body of five aggregates, your nature is basically pure. It can't be corrupted. Once you stop clinging and let things be, you'll be free, even of birth and death. You'll transform everything. You'll possess spiritual powers that can't be obstructed and you'll be at peace wherever you are. If you doubt this, you'll never see through anything. You're better off doing nothing. Once you act, you can't avoid the cycle of birth and death. But once you see your nature, you're a Buddha, even if you work as a butcher. 
So in other words, they teach moral relativism, which means that if you are a child molester or a rapist, doesn't matter. You are pure. Your nature is so good that you don't have to worry about what anything that you do in the body actually means spiritually. So there is no such thing as the conviction of sin. There is no such thing as having a guilty conscience about something. And there is no such thing as repentance. And there's very much this emphasis on the idea that the body does not impact the spiritual, which is not what the Bible teaches. There were some heretical sects, such as Gnostics, who believed that the body was immaterial and that it didn't impact upon the spiritual. But that is not what the scriptures say. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the body is not to be defiled. The body is very much important to God. He owns it especially if you have taken the blood of Jesus as payment for your sins. We rent this space. We never made it. It doesn't belong to us. And it is a privilege to be here. What we do with God's creation and what we do to God's creation matters. What Buddhism teaches people about being essentially good no matter how depraved and evil their behavior actually is, is completely antithetical to what Jesus taught. And it's expressly denounced in the Bible. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Christianity is not about shaming you or giving you a parole officer. It's actually more about giving you a father figure and a family, a father figure who shows you how to be a decent person and how to be part of a functional family who actually care about your well-being and who care about your behavior. Buddhism, on the other hand, is like joining a gang where someone shows you how to sell drugs and shoot people. Think about the troubled teens who are out all night getting wasted with their friends, sleeping with random strangers, setting fire to cars, graffitiing buildings, smashing windows, stealing things, beating someone up because they looked at them the wrong way. Are those kids listening to the advice of loving parents, or are they a law unto themselves? When the Apostle Paul wrote, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, what he's talking about is the difference between listening to a parent and following the rules of the household or getting sent to a juvenile prison because you can't be trusted to make good choices and being given a parole officer. That's not Christianity. Christianity is about actually having a functional family and being a functional member of the community. 
It's neither a form of gang, nor is it a form of prison. God, as a loving parent, is all about moderation. Moderation does not mean neutrality. Those things are completely different. And when people say that Christianity teaches the same thing that Buddhism teaches through the middle way, that is not true. The middle way is all about moral relativism. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach detachment from people. It teaches compassion and actively moving towards people to try and reach them and to try and talk about sin and to try and talk to them about God and where they're going in their life and what they're doing. And teaching moderation is teaching people the way that a loving parent should, which is to teach them boundaries, to teach them that there is such a thing as right and wrong, but within the parameters of right and wrong is freedom to be yourself. It is not legalism and it is not lawlessness. Buddhism teaches lawlessness. That is not what Christianity teaches. God is compassionate, but that doesn't mean he has no standards. He is slow to anger, but that doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. What Buddhism teaches inevitably ends up exploiting other people financially, spiritually, and sexually. And in the process of teaching people that it's perfectly okay to trample everyone else, it also puffs them up, puffs up their ego by telling them that they're now enlightened. They're so enlightened that they don't need to be accountable for anything that they do. As Osho himself said, he exploits people. He does it as a teaching mechanism. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever exploit people as a teachable moment? Did he ever mistreat people as a way of waking them up? Did he ever exploit people to the tune of $200 million? Did he ever degrade people by making them do crazy dances while naked? The Bible does talk about teachers like Osho in 2 Timothy. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this is what the Bible has to say about teachers like Osho. It says that teachers like him are full of lusts and self-aggrandizement and greed who pursue their own ends instead of trying to pursue God's. Truth is what they say it is. Wisdom is whatever you think it is. And you can just change reality to suit your own circumstances. You can use your newfound wisdom of enlightenment to manipulate other people and no one can hold you to account. They claim to know what love and compassion means, but everything that they teach is self-serving, exploits other people, and leaves them hurt and degraded. Buddhism is the gospel of narcissism. So let's have a look at the difference between compassion and permissiveness. Because karma is all about self-improvement and striving to liberate oneself from the confines of human frailty by either denying that anything about us is flawed in the first place or becoming so detached from other people that we no longer care, this is known as enlightenment. Reincarnation is the hellish Groundhog Day concept of repeating life over and over again until all the karmic baggage of your guilty conscience has been shed and you can tell yourself that you're now better than everyone else. You've experienced all the lessons you signed up for on your tour through life and now you get to be at peace. 
The Bible does not teach that we can become better people through our own effort, nor that we can atone for our sins in any way which would be acceptable to God, nor does it teach that we're tourists passing through an exhibition. It very much teaches that what we do in life has real consequences, and there is only one who can make restitution for us, Christ Jesus, which he did by dying in our place so that we didn't have to bear the repercussions for the things we have done. It also doesn't teach that our past deeds cease to exist or that they didn't matter. Instead, it teaches that in spite of what we have done, God can redeem us, change us, and give us a new purpose in life. The Bible teaches that if we have encountered God and realized the magnitude of our wretchedness, then we will understand why other people do the things that they do and we will see shades of our former selves in the people around us who are still lost and still prone to the same wretchedness. That doesn't make their behavior acceptable. We're not justifying their deeds or our own at all. We're saying that God's grace saves us from ourselves and transforms wretched people into increasingly less wretched people. Rather than a process of enlightenment, we have a process of sanctification. We are washed clean of the past and no longer shackled to who we were, which affords us the opportunity to live differently from now on and not mess up this second chance at life. God's redemption is so gracious and overwhelming that if someone like Osho, who had exploited tens of thousands of people over many years, had realized the truth before he died and turned to God for mercy and help, God would do it. We don't know for sure if Osho made it to heaven or not, because that is something he had to work out between himself and God. However, it is possible. We have an example in the Old Testament of God showing forgiveness to someone who was much, much worse than Osho, King Manasseh. It says in Second Chronicles, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him. And God received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Manasseh was heavily into idolatry, witchcraft, mediumship, and even child sacrifice, killing two of his own children. He defiled the temple in Jerusalem with Baal statues and burned children alive in the Valley of Hinnom. As you can see from this passage, God's compassion does not overlook or condone evil. Compassion is not permissiveness. God is kind. God redeems the irredeemable. He shows mercy, but that doesn't mean that he has no standards. He does punish people, and sometimes he punishes people for the express purpose of trying to make them turn away from their evil deeds. There are very real consequences for sin, and you can either experience them in this life, or you can experience them in eternity. But whether you do it now, or you do it later, you will have to give an account to your Creator. Christian compassion is supposed to be holistic in that it doesn't just deal with people's physical needs by helping them out in times of dire straits. It's also supposed to address different issues of sin and get them to confront problems in their lives. Christians are supposed to confront people about their behavior and about their spiritual walk. Jesus is the light of the world and in his presence all our deeds are exposed, both good and bad. Our willingness to be humble enough to expose ourselves to that scrutiny determines how God deals with the demands for justice and his preference for mercy. Are we willing to change or do we insist that we're a Buddha and our nature is basically pure, even though we have continually hurt others and hurt ourselves through the failure to meet God's standards of love? He wants to work with us, but we have to let go of the idea that we don't need him. We also need to reject the idea that the problem isn't our behavior, but that we got caught or are being held accountable for our behavior. Being held accountable for your behavior is not the problem. The problem is your behavior. So the most compassionate thing that a Christian can do is to tell people to stop 
avoiding the light, especially through things like Buddhism. Our deeds are going to be exposed sooner or later. And the sooner we deal with them and reckon with God, then the sooner we can start the healing process. And that is true compassion. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. If you want more information or references, I have linked the blog article in the description box underneath this video, so you can check that out there. Don't forget to subscribe. Let me know in the comments if you have had your own encounter with Buddhism and what your understanding of it led to. Take care and I will see you next time. Bye.